we're talking about injection attacks. And I was originally, you know, I often put pictures in my slides that are like vaguely related to the thing I'm talking about. And I started looking at pictures of syringes and I'm like, ah, uh, I can only do one of these. And I started looking at some of them and I was just like, freaking the hell out. So the any picture of the syringe we've got in the lectures. So um, it's, but we are talking about injection attacks. So, and the two examples uh, are command injection and SQL injection. Uh, but there are loads of, of different kinds of injection attacks. And in fact, uh, cross-site scripting is a form of injection attack, which is what we covered last week. So basically, in injection attacks, what happens when we get some input from a user and we end up sending it to an interpreter. So whether that interpreter is the web browser and the JavaScript engine within the web browser, mm -hmm. or the interpreter is like a database engine, for example, to MySQL or PostgreSQL, um, we send that information uh, as part of a query and that information gets interpreted as code instead of as data. So because we've um, not been careful enough about the way that we're treating the information coming from the user, we end up accidentally running it as code that gets executed somewhere. So there's all kinds of security problems that um, basically uh, the root cause is like an injection attack. So some examples are um, operating system, like command injection. So we can inject something into a shell script, for example, or inject something that ends up getting interpreted by a shell. Uh, when we can inject um, SQL code, or SQL, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, or NoSQL, uh, we can inject uh, commands into LDAP lookups. So LDAP is an authentication system used, um, well, it's a, a lightweight directory um, uh, basically a database that has, uh, often it's used to store information about an organization which can, can include like phone numbers and details of employees, but it's also often used to store like a, as a central store for passwords. But it's basically a database you do lookups against, so again, injections are possible. You can inject into a, an XML file or a lookup in an XML file, like an XPath, which is a way of addressing a location within an XML, uh, and all sorts of other things where you can inject um, code into uh, an, an, an object mm -hmm. and for the parser to interpret it not the way that it's intended. So in injection attacks are super prevalent um, and you know, last week we talked about cross-site scripting and I said that is the most prevalent kind of attack that exists. Well, that is a form of injection attack. So if you want to speak more broadly, then injection attacks as a whole is obviously, you know, huge. So, but the, again, the, it can have a severe impact. It can basically, anything you can imagine that could go wrong, can go wrong with injection attacks, where you can end up having mass disclosure of data so we managed to trick a SQL query, for example, to returning more like sensitive information that, that we don't expect the user to get access to. So for example, getting access to every other user's account on a, on a web page, for example, and all of their sensitive information, um, like losing the data uh, in the sense of like actual modification and deletion of data. Um, there is potentially complete databases or entire systems can be compromised. Talking about operating system command injection, you can end up with like shell access where the um, attacker ends up being able to take full control of the server. And in other cases, um, like for SQL injection, there are some fringe cases where you end up with shell on the server, but often you end up with like full read write access to a database. And that can be just as harmful to an organization. So you can imagine there's massive business impact uh, and it just depends on the kind of business and what you're trying to protect and the actual details. So we talked about cross-site scripting um, and that is an example of injection attacks. And basically in that example that we talked about last week, you're crafting some JavaScript that ends up being injected into a website, which is then interpreted as JavaScript to run in their web browser. But another example is operating system command injection. So where we actually end up injecting code into like an, a query that's sent to a command shell, like to, for example, the bash shell on a Linux system. So uh, 
This is an example that is not website based. This is a nice little uh, small piece of C code where we've got um, basically we're including standard input output. We've got your, the main function, which is where most all the code lives in this case. We've got two variables, a name and a command. We ask them what their name is. We store that into the um, variable name. We print to the screen, hello. Uh, sorry, we're not printing to the screen. We're printing to a variable. Hello, person's name. And then echo. The time is currently. Um, and then we're running. Uh, the command date. So we're basically we're constructing a string that we then end up sending through to bash uh, which then runs that command. So um, if we have a, uh, have a look so So the, here's our um, C program that I just mentioned. I um, may as well fix the indenting because I just noticed that the, it's not quite right. Um, so we've got a main function, and um, I've just talked through that code. So all is well. So we'll save that. Uh, with a C program, we obviously we just compile it. So GCC, and then the, the name of the file that we want to compile. And if we want to specify an output, we can specify where we want that to go. It compiles the program. We can run that um, program. It asks for the name. It says, hello world, the time is currently. Clearly, the, the security problem here is that we're sending through the um, what the user's entering directly through to Bash. And so we're trusting that the user is actually going to enter in their name and not something like um, which will basically the because it's passing that through to bash it's just passing through um, the input that I provided which was like a semicolon which tells it to start a new command and then type cat atc password and it happily run that command uh, and, and send that to the to the console so the error there is, again, same as last week, there's a lack of validation, sanitization. They're not, we're not being careful about how we're using the, the user's information. And the reason it's a command injection attack is because we're taking what the user has entered and we're sending it through to an interpreter, in this case Bash, without being careful about how it's going to interpret that information that's being sent through. So. So yeah, so the, the problem here is we're basically printing out as a command to the shell, but there's no reason that the attacker can't basically modify this input to, um, to basically change the behavior significantly. So if you're trying to find a command injection, like operating system command injection, you can try some of the characters that bash interprets in certain ways. So you can try semicolons. Um, you can try different ways of running commands from Bash, which include the, um, the I don't know, what do you call that type of apostrophe? <laughs> the, uh, the not the tilde button. Oh, actually, on a UK keyboard, the tilde is somewhere else, so you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, the tilde is the squiggly line, but it's actually over there. So on a US keyboard, it's uh, in the same spot. So And then there's double quotes and single quotes. You can try those sorts of things and, and see what happens. So I've got another example here of a website. So in this case, um, okay. so damn vulnerable web app uh, is a website. That is damn vulnerable. Um, and so there's a bunch of th ways that you can attack it. So rather than show you the example that is the exact same example that you're doing in the labs, I'm, trying to, I'm showing, you, showing you a different example. But in this case, we can do command injection. And, and here, it wants to be given a host name, which it will then ping and set, give us the results of. And you can imagine the way that it does that is basically it's just running a command and then returning us the results. 
So again, we can uh, do something like <coughs> so we're saying, okay, whatever they were trying to do, let's stop that command and we're going to insert our own command which is to print out that file. Uh, and you can see here that that, that succeeds because um, of the way that they coded the thing. So we can actually have a look at the source code here of how it works. So it's basically getting the request of the IP address and then it's basically constructing a um, the command here and so we're on a Linux system so it's basically just executing from the shell ping uh, and it's pa passing along the target um, and if we just put a, sem a semicolon in we can type whatever the hell we want and that command's going to end up being sent through to the bash shell on this server that the web page is running on and obviously we can do all sorts of things that they don't want us to do including reading or writing to whatever files the web server can read to and write from so we could basically probably delete all the files off the Apache server, for example. Um, would obviously not be a great thing if that was your website. Um, another thing is file names in, on Linux systems can actually include all kinds of weird and wonderful things. So you could upload a file that actually has like a command in the file name and then if they use that file name to do something without being careful about how they're using the file name, again, you could break things by having a, your own command thing run on their system. So SQL injection attacks are another really common um, attack on a website. And basically, it happens when we are sending a query to a database that we're dynamically generating and we end up including the stuff coming from the user in that database query and it ends up getting interpreted as, as code. So we end up modifying the SQL commands that are being sent to the database. So most websites store data in some kind of database and usually that's a, a SQL database and typically you have the database running on the same server that the website's running on. So you've got your web server uh, and on that same system you'll have something like MySQL or um, PostgreSQL also running on that server and it's actually hosting the database that the website is querying and that's where it stores all the information about user accounts and messages that user, users have sent and things like that get stored in the database and then when the website needs to do something it grabs stuff out of the database and displays it to the user. The user wants to send a message to another user or put a post to a message board or something. It'll take the input from the user and put it into the database so it can generate that you know, message board or whatever it is. So the database is like the place where everything actually, where the data gets stored, obviously. So the, the website like, accepts a request from the users, connects to its database and sends the queries um, to do all sorts of things that it needs to do. So, <coughs> so here is an example of a query done the wrong way um, where we're basically creating a SQL query to send to a database and we're actually using like a, a variable to, to create that we're inserting into that query and in this case this variable is coming from the user um, and so the, the, the untrusted information coming from the user ends up being put into that command, database command, and sent through to the, the, the database and, and will then you know, cause mischief. So in this case, if this is the, the actual query here, so we're saying select the first name and the last name from, the, from users, so that's the table that we're getting it from, where user ID equals the ID. So it seems if you didn't know, again, if you didn't know what you were doing, you'd look at that and say, think maybe that looks pretty safe. Basically we're getting, um, using the, the ID and we're using that to look up some information from a database. But basically it doesn't even really matter what any of the rest of the query is. As soon as we're getting something from a user and including it in our query without being careful about it, it's broken, we've got a security problem. So in this case, we could send something like this along, 
uh, which then ends up with, if you insert that into this place where we've got the placeholder of your dollar ID, we end up with this query. So now the query is actually saying, select the first name and the last name from users where the user ID is you know, nothing, or if one equals one. So basically, it's gonna, it's, one's always going to be one. So for every single entry in that database, it's going to, uh, in that table, it's going to say, does one equals one? Yeah, OK. So we're going to pull that value out of, the, out of that table, and it will show you every single record of, that, of every user on that system. And so it's going to return everything. Uh, there's an important context, um, important terminology when you're talking about injection attacks, and that's the injection context. And in this case, the injection context is within single quotes. So here, we're injecting our part of the code into somewhere where there's single quotes. And if we know that, or we can figure it out, because there's not that many things to try, if we know we're within single quotes, all we need to do is end the single quote to no longer be in the quotes. We can put some more commands in, and then we, as long as we finish by opening another quote, so that this is closing that quote, uh, then we're good to go. So we just we need to inject in, realizing that we're in the context of single quotes. Uh, and again, I can show you an example of that. Uh, and so so when uh, so we can look at SQL injection attacks, and here. The idea here is that we enter an ID in, and it looks up that, that user detail. So again, already it's not like particularly secure, because we could just iterate through them. But if we want to dump the information from the database, because say, for example, this was checking that we actually were only allowed to look at certain IDs, we can then basically insert into that query, and we'll end up being provided by the database with all of the information. And we can look at the source code that's generating <coughs> generating that and you can see here basically we've got a query and just as the exactly the same as the example that I just walked through where we've got the ID and it is basically in there and it's a single single quotes context um, so there's all kinds of things we can do to try and be a bit more clever and extract all sorts of other things from the database. As soon as we can in inject commands into the interpreter for the database, we can we could tell it to do anything. As long as the user that that query is being uh, has the permission to do whatever we're asking for it to do, it'll happily do whatever we ask it to do. So if we want to know like what version of the database um, is being used, we can basically pull the version. We could find the database name. We can access the user that is currently accessing the database. We can list the tables um, by like basically querying the table name from information schema.tables. And um, we can list all the columns in a table by basically concatenating uh, the information from the schema. So I'll show you how you can do that. So if you just want to grab, for example, the version from a database, you can see here the, the SQL query that we're creating is basically the same as before, except we're then using union to combine it with another select statement, because then we can write whatever select statement we want uh, in order to ask whatever we want out of the database. So in this case, we're selecting the version, and we have to also match the number of columns that the first select query is providing. And in this case, there's two columns that it's providing, so we need a second column. In this case, we're saying null, and uh, the hash uh, does, you go, does anyone know here know what the hash does in SQL when you're writing SQL? It's just a comment. So it's just going to make everything else. We'll just ignore whatever comes after that. So now, uh, whoops. The, so now if we go back to this, we try that command. Basically, if we look at that last entry that's come back, because it's returned everything, but also at the end, it's returned back the actual version of the database that's running. And similarly, we can ask for the database. Uh, and we'll get the, the the database that this is actually running on the you know on this Apache server. The database that it's using is called DVWA database. Uh, we could ask for um, user, and that's going to give us the username 
on the database that's accessing the, the, the database. Um, and so we can also um, look up the, all the table names. So in this case, information schema is um, basically it's, it's like a database that describes all of the, all of the tables and contents of everything inside the database. So if we can use, if we can access that, we can get at all of the information that might be interesting. So here, uh, what we can end up doing um, is we are, uh, we look down the bottom here, we can see we can see all the names of all the tables that exist on that system. So if we scroll down to the bottom, uh, we can see there's like a users table and there's like a, a guestbook table and a bunch of other stuff. Um, you can also uh, do things like print off um, specific, uh, basically we're concatenating a bunch of, because remember we have to print to one column, we have to create a select statement that generates two columns. So at most we can pull two things at once, but we can also just concatenate stuff together into one of those columns. So in this example, we're like concatenating the first name, last name, the user, and the password. So in this case, if we actually do this command injection, um, you can see that we're actually dumping um, the, all the details, including the actual hash of the password. So that, that was just stored in the database under the password. Um, password. Uh, column, so we just dumped that out, and now if we wanted to, we could run that through a password cracker, for example, and try and find the original passwords of those users uh, on the system. So, or we could try an online um, password cracker, <coughs> uh, because uh, I'm not sure, but at first glance, that looks like it might be an MD5 hash, and um, I know for a fact the password on this system is actually password, so probably. If we, do, if we, actually, if we probably just Google that, who knows, maybe the first response, the result will just be, um, tell us what it is. Yeah. So the, 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 that MD5 hash, if we run it through a password cracker, it wouldn't take long to figure out that that's what the password was. Or we can just Google it if, like, hopefully not too many people use passwords that you can literally Google, but, yeah. Um, but also, if you've I don't know if you've noticed this, but each time it's actually echoing back to the screen what we've just put in here. So there's a pretty good chance that we could that there's a there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability here as well. So obviously it's not the intention of this like exercise, but um, you can kind of imagine. And also I'll mention here instead of saying one plus one equals one, I put one equals zero so that it didn't dump the database first. The stuff that's there, I'm just trying to dump this instead. Uh, so it's saying ignore the que previous query and get a new query. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. Say, say we were trying to actually insert some, some. Um, we might try something like this. So because the web, basically the web browser is echoing it back at us, there's also like a cross-site scripting vulnerability there as well because it's like echoing back to the user. Um, okay. So sometimes it's even it's more complicated than that. So sometimes the SQL injection vulnerability is in a part of the code where it's not actually showing back to you stuff that's it's getting back from the SQL query. 
If it's just using that SQL query internally as part of the logic, then it's showing you something else. Sometimes it, you can't just like start dumping stuff out of the database. But what you can still do is basically get yes or no answers out of the database. So it might be that you can set, basically create your query that you're injecting in a way where it will trigger an error um, in, if, the, if the answer to your question is yes and not trigger an answer if the question is no. Or equally, sometimes you have to look at the timing of the response that's coming back from the database and you can tell actually that database query is taking a really long time and therefore it's doing more and therefore we can basically deduce something about the information in the database based on how long it takes for us to for it to respond to us. There are also things you can do to try and fuzz a lot of this stuff uh, and you can kind of just hammer queries with, with all sorts of um, inputs to try and find uh, whether there are injections. A lot of the automated tools do this, it basically just hammers the query. Uh, and so if there's somewhere where there's input coming from a user, if you use like automated security testing tools, it'll just slam it with a bunch of random input. If you're doing a proper security audit of a system, you might not want to do that. Why, why would that be? If we're talking about a live system that we're testing, why might might we not want to slam it with random SQL queries? You could do all kinds of things by accident. Depending on what the fuzz is doing to your database, you could end up with loads of entries of all sorts of random junk. Um, and you just want to be careful. And it's often fuzzing makes sense, but you just want to be careful about what you're fuzzing. If you're fuzzing like entries into a database, and they're getting, you know that they're being stored in a database, for example, you want to make sure that you're not filling it with stuff that's going to like break the website for other users and things like that. But yeah, I just, um, I kind of already did this last week, but, um, la uh, or the other week. But if you, but if you um, want to try and like fuzz something like this, Again, you can basically start, um, actually, no, I probably don't even need to do that. I can just look at whatever the last request was. Uh, and can basically fuzz from that. <coughs> no. Let's do it on the next example because the other thing that I was going to talk about is bad defenses against this stuff. So let me come back to the fuzzing in a minute. So a lot of the um, a lot of the ways that you can defend against these attacks is basically by trying to carefully sanitize any kind of user controlled input. So anything coming from the user, you want to try and prevent things from going wrong. So that includes URL parameters, form fields, headers, cookies, file names, it's just like everything coming from the user, we need to make sure that we're being very careful about how we use it. For cross that scripting, we already understand now that we need to be careful about JavaScript code and things that are going to be interpreted that way. For SQL, we want to make sure we're avoiding user changing the logic of the query that's happening. So that's not actually particularly easy to do. Um, and often when something comes from a user, you're going to transform it multiple ways. So you might encode it, um, you know, just to make it easier to store the information and then you might encode it again in some other way. You might like remove spaces or whatever you do with that input. Uh, and if you're not really careful about how you are using that information and if you're not sanitizing correctly uh, and a, a clever attacker will try and figure their way out of whatever things that you've tried to put in place to, to defend. So the, 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 the attackers are trying to trick the interpreter to parser into executing commands uh, and potentially it can take advantage of when you're doing multiple layers of transformations. Uh, and validation's not enough because for example a uh, like a single quote can break things, but some people's names have single quotes in them, for example. Like Jack O'Neill, for example. I don't know if any of you are old and geeky enough to get the reference. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, couldn't, I couldn't resist. I was like, what's a name that has a, uh, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, single quote. Some people actually have a single quote in their name, so we have to let them have a single quote in their name. We can't just say, well, you know, like Amy's name, for example, has the, you know, um, whatever you, the accent over the E. You can't say, well, sorry, you're not allowed that. Um, if we want to support the, like, real names that exist, we need to just very carefully treat that information that we receive. So um, we want to, to let them be called O'Neill, but not actually interpret it as a single quote when we're running it as a SQL command. Um, and one way to do that is to use escaping. Um, and so for example, to escape a quote, um, you can basically, I don't know, like I'll show you just for example at the um, command line, if you're trying to say, Right, like literally the, the bash command is going to see that as being an empty string. But if we literally want it to print out like the single quotes, then we can basically escape it and it changes the way that that interpreter uses that information. So we're saying these single quotes are something to display to the screen or to use as like literally single quotes and not trying to be clever about what those quotes mean. Uh, and so the same thing applies to uh, like SQL commands where you can escape things to say, now this, this is really like the literal meaning of a quote not to end whatever quote we've started and so escaping a quote a, a single like apostrophe for example can potentially stop certain things from going wrong and so you can use escaping and if you escape everything really well it could be enough to make the system secure but often escaping is hard to do correctly so, I mean, ideally we do a proper source code review, look at the source code if we're actually trying to prevent this thing from happening in the first place, look wherever we're getting at user input. If we're ever putting that into a dynamic query, we need to be really careful about it. We can use automated testing to like check whether it can automatically pick out problems. So we can do the fuzzing stuff while we're doing our development, for example, and we can use static analysis to try and pick up errors that we're making. And basically, this is the order of what you should do if you can to make it secure. So first of all, if you can, use a safe API. So instead of writing that query in a string and sending it to the interpreter, mm -hmm. there are safer ways that you can do that, where you basically call a parameterized query instead of creating a string that you then just pass through an interpreter. Um, and on the next slide, I'll give a bit more detail about what that means. But if you can also just avoid using external interpreters, that is better from a security perspective. So instead of calling bash shell and running like a command, like ping for example, is there a way to do that from within PHP? Where it doesn't, like, then you avoid the problem of like basically, if we're just trying to ping an IP address, and we, if, we, if the only option we have is to do it via a call to system, which in C, it basically means that you're um, running the bash shell, then it's just a lot safer if you can do things directly from libraries and the, the platform that you're using. You can use stored procedures, which is basically where you pre-write your SQL query, save it in a place inside the database itself, and then instead of you specifying the whole query, you just say, I'm gonna use that stored procedure, and it just runs that again. Uh, and that, that's safer because you're not actually dynamically generating that query each time, it's just in the database. Um, if possible, you can use server-side whitelists, which we've talked about before, but often that's difficult, for example, for like apostrophes. Um, so otherwise, we can use escaping to try and render the input harmless. It's not perfect, it's better if we can use parameterized queries, but if we have to, we can do escaping, but it can break when we transform or if we incorrectly apply the escaping, and I'll give an example of that in a minute. And you can use limit in queries to prevent mass disclosure. So if at the end of your SQL query command you put limit one, um, then that will mean that it will only return one value, which even if an attacker can inject um, into, if that limit still applies, um, depending on the kind of injection that they're capable of doing, then it will only be returning one value at a time, which at the very least might make it more difficult for an attacker. 
So with parameterized queries, we define uh, the SQL first. Uh, so we specify this is the SQL code and this is where our variables are going to go. And then you pass in those variables to the parameterized command. And that way it knows this part is the SQL command and this is a variable. This is like data that's coming from the user. And then no matter what the user uses, it knows that it's not part of the SQL command because it's a parameterized query. So you can insert whatever you want into it, but it's clever enough. Now the parser knows I'm not even going to try and interpret the stuff coming from the user as a command because that's not part of the command. So the, there's, there's an example here where um, we use MySQLi escape uh, real estate escape string, but actually escaping in this case is only secure if we're using it from a literal string quote context. Um, and in, as we'll see in the example that we're going to look at, that's not the case here. So in this um, here, if we go to, um, <coughs> we can change the security level from low to medium and go back to injection. This time, it just wants us to choose an ID um, and submit it, and it's going to return it from our um, from here. We could uh, basically edit that. So if we want to edit it to something else, I think did I copy the whole thing? So here, uh, I can basically. <coughs> Right, so in this case, the, the problem, uh, let's see, so if we send that and we get back the um, successful values from the database in there somewhere, I'm doing, um, maybe we should just, sorry. So in, in this case, the, basically, the, the, what our attack looks like has changed slightly. So instead of starting with a single quote, we haven't. Uh, and the reason, and we've just ended with a, with a comment. And that has uh, basically done what we needed it to do. And if we look at the source code now for the medium level security version of this, it's escaping the string, but it doesn't help very much because that string is still sent through to the query. Uh, and it's not being used in quotes. So here, we're, cur we're, we're escaping the string, but if this was in single quotes, then that would be fairly secure, or more, sec I think it would be <coughs> secure. But because they haven't put it in quotes, the, like in single quotes, then the escaping hasn't like helped much. Um, there's, um, and if we, and I mentioned before the fuzzing thing. So we could um, take this and fuzz it. And here, if we want to fuzz this part of the part of the query, we can add from a file fuzzer. There's like a list of files with things that can successfully fuzz things and if we just fire the SQL stuff against it. If we know that we're the type of SQL database, we might want to not run the others. Um, and we can basically run that and fire that off against it. And then you see we get a bunch of stuff back which can be hard to make sense of, but because we're trying to like dump data, one quick way of looking at that is just to order it by the size. So if we do get something back that has a lot of information, then um, then that might be an indication that it succeeded. Well, then again, maybe they all failed. Maybe the um, since I know 
what we can do here is um, do the same thing, but leave the comment at the end. <coughs> See if that has more success. So we can buzz again with um, SQL injections. And look at the responses. You can see the longest responses, and these have successfully fuzzed. And you can see the, some of the stuff here um, at this point here, some of the commands that have successfully like fuzzed the system. Uh, and there's, there's a few there. And it also points out that there's reflected um, input back at the user, which is like an indication that might be um, vulnerable to cross site scripting. Um, Okay. So some other things that you can use to defend against uh, injection attacks. Um, so for SQL injection, make sure you're actually using database security features. So have users and privileges. Don't just have a root user for your database that your website uses. Each website that you create should have its own user that just gets access to the tables that it needs in order to do that website. Um, you can also create views in databases that just have certain parts of the database that, to, and you can enable just access to those parts of the database rather than to everything. Um, and don't store things in your database in plain text if they're really sensitive. So either encrypt them or use hashes. Uh, and don't display the detailed error messages back to users because they can use that to problem solve and figure out, you know, oh, we've got a helpful SQL error here that can make, help me figure out actually what I need to do to successfully break this system. And obviously, as I mentioned the, in previous weeks, web application firewalls can help as well. So in conclusion, injections are like super easy program mistakes to make, and they, have, they can have some pretty significant ramifications. Uh, so we talked about some of the kinds of attacks that exist and the things you can do to defend against them. 